It's time for this week in political history. The 1972 presidential election ended in a historic landslide. Richard Nixon won 49 out of 50 states over his Democratic opponent, George McGovern. But things weren't so clear when it started off. Ed Muskie, the senator from Maine and the Democratic nominee for VP in 1968, was considered the frontrunner. But that didn't stop others from trying. In addition to Muskie and McGovern, there was, among others, Hubert Humphrey, who narrowly lost to Nixon in 68, Scoop Jackson, the hawkish senator from Washington, and George Wallace, the Alabama governor who ran as a third-party candidate four years earlier and carried five states. This time, Wallace was running for the Democratic nomination. Nobody gave Wallace much of a chance of winning the nomination. His 1968 effort echoed segregationist themes that he had used in his earlier Alabama campaigns. Yes, he had softened his rhetoric in 1972, but critics said he was just talking in code. He spoke a lot about average folks. He called for lower taxes. He wanted to keep the streets safe. He also made his opposition to busing children to achieve racial balance in schools a key issue in his campaign. This matter that they've come up with of busing little children to achieve racial balance is the most asinine, atrocious, callous thing I've ever heard of in the United States. What the party establishment didn't like was the fact that Wallace started winning. He easily took the Florida primary, where Muskie finished fourth and began his quick descent, and won big in Tennessee and North Carolina as well. Next on the calendar were two states out of the South, Maryland and Michigan, both on May 16th. Polls indicated Wallace could do very well in both, if not win them. Then came the unthinkable. It was on May 15th, as Wallace campaigned in Laurel, Maryland. George Wallace was shot down this afternoon as he campaigned in Maryland, not far from Washington. We are dispensing with our normal format to bring you that story. Howard? At last report, Governor Wallace's condition was described as critical but stable at Holy Cross Hospital in Silver Spring, Maryland, just outside Washington. Police were reported holding one suspect in the shooting. He was described by an eyewitness as a blonde youth in his 20s or early 30s. The 52-year-old Wallace had just finished talking to a crowd at a shopping center in Laurel, Maryland, and had stepped from behind a bulletproof podium when the shots rang out. The assassination attempt took place 43 years ago this week. The shooting left Wallace paralyzed from the waist down. For the rest of his life, through 10 more years as governor and until his death in 1998, he was in a wheelchair. His son, George Wallace Jr., went on to a political career of his own. He served two terms as state treasurer of Alabama and two more on the State Public Service Commission. George Wallace, welcome to the program. Well, Ken, thank you. It's good to be with you. And uh, listening to the uh, some of those things really took me back in time, really did. You wrote a book entitled Governor George Wallace, The Man You Never Knew. What don't we know about George Wallace? Well, there, there are several things I tried to talk about in, in the book. I tried to talk about him and write about him in a very introspective way and in a comprehensive way, uh, I, I realize more than, than most that my father's is defined by a couple of images, segregation forever and schoolhouse door, and uh, those were certainly part of uh, his journey, but it was not the total journey. At one time in his life, he did support segregation, and he told me over over the years, as he told John Kennedy Jr. and others, that uh, he was raised in an era, having been born in 1919, almost 100 years ago, that with the belief, and he was taught, that segregation was in the best interest of both races. That's what people generally of the South believed. It was not accepted with ill will or ill feeling or malice. It's just a sense they had that it was in the best interest of both races, and that anything other than that could bring about adverse relations. But he believed that until time passed and his conscience told him he was wrong about that, at which time he went to Dr. King's church and told the congregation he'd been wrong and asked for their forgiveness. 
he was so charismatic, Ken, and dynamic and defined in terms of the federal government and the battle between the sovereignty of the states and the federal government and the Tenth Amendment Reserve Clause, you know, all those things. Many people took it as uh, ill feeling toward black people, and it was never that. He did believe in segregation at one time. But that's concerned me. Another thing, uh, the violence at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, many people don't realize this, and I was on Larry King Live several years ago with Jesse Jackson and Mike Wallace, and when Mike was still with us, and was able to talk about the fact that his orders at the Edmund Pettus Bridge were disobeyed. The last thing he wanted was violence, and it had been decided that the marchers crossed the bridge, allowed them to march. He would contact President Johnson, determine how to protect the marchers, because unbeknownst to many people, there were rumors about groups such as the Minutemen and others who planned to have snipers along Highway 80 from Selma to Montgomery, and uh, that concerned my father deeply. So when he got the the word in his office, is written by Bob Ingram, who was with the Montgomery Advertiser at the time, uh, when he heard, learned of the violence, he said he wrote that he'd never seen a man as enraged in his life as he saw my father when he learned what happened at the bridge. So that bothered him until the day he died, and he called John Lewis on several occasions, and I know John Lewis, and he related to him that his orders were disobeyed. The last thing he wanted was violence. It became very emotional, John Lewis says, as he talked about it. So my father was a good and decent man who was on the wrong side of uh, an issue early on but got things right and worked to bring about nurture our common humanity, and I think that's a, a great lesson for us all. We could talk about your father for hours, and at some point I hope we will. But for this week, let me focus on that awful day in, in Laurel, Maryland. Uh, first, tell us what you were doing at the time of the shooting. How did you hear the news? Um, were you in school? Were you on the campaign? Well, I had a little of both. I'd been on the campaign for about a week, and then I was back in Tuscaloosa at the University of Alabama for a couple of days rest, and I was to rejoin the campaign. So I'd left the day before, and... Uh, it's really interesting. We'd been to Michigan, Maryland, back and forth. As you know, those primaries were the next day. And I had a very vivid dream that he had been shot. And actually, I dreamed he was shot in the thro- had been shot in the throat and died from that. And actually, Nick Zorvitz, a Secret Service agent, was shot in the throat. It, things were very volatile. You knew something was about to break because, the, as they call it, the big momentum was on his side. He, I, I don't think he could have been stopped in terms of the nomination, Democratic nomination, had he not been stopped the way he was because the momentum, you just feel it. And I think he always thought, he told me later, he said, I I realized how volatile I was and controversial. And he said, I really thought 68 was the year I would be shot. And said when he was shot, what he told us later, he said, I always thought it would be a head wound, and I'd die from that. He said, I never envisioned being paralyzed and in constant chronic pain. In that way, but uh, he didn't intend to work the crowd that day. Uh, he came down, the Secret Service was about to usher him to the car, he took off his coat, and he said, no, I'm going to shake hands, I'll take responsibility. And when he hit the ground, he told me, he said, I, I closed my eyes for about 20 seconds, and uh, his head was to the left, and he said, I pretended as though I was dead because I didn't know if there was a second gunman, and I wanted him to think I was dead. But uh, he uh, was able to survive the shooting, but was, of course, paralyzed the rest of his life. Your dad was attracting huge crowds during the campaign, uh, but there were widespread protests at many of the events as well, with people trying to shout him down. Did you ever witness any of that, and what was your reaction to that? Oh, I did. I witnessed a lot of it in Michigan and different places. You'd have a huge crowd of 10,000 people, but you'd have two or 300 down front shouting, trying to shout uh, him down, and he would go back and forth with the protesters, and that was uh, vintage George Wallace. He was so good at it. But uh, I do remember I played music and still do and was playing some for the campaign. When I was playing, they would be, I'd be looking at these young people my age, 18, 19, and I think, you know, we probably have so much in common, but we're so far apart in so many ways too. But um, it was oftentimes so volatile at these rallies that had my dad not uh, spoken to his supporters about restraining themselves, I think they would have, many of them would have turned on the protesters, actually. Did your father ever talk about 
possible fear or apprehension about his personal safety? Never did to me. I never heard anyone say that he related. I think he certainly knew in 1968 uh, Secret Service became so concerned about him that they had him carry a pistol in his overcoat for a couple of days, and then he gave it back. He said, I don't feel comfortable with this because there were a couple of times he got separated. The crowd, would, the protesters were would intervene as he was trying to enter a car, and it would become a uh, just a brawl, really, to get him in the car. And then... Uh, and in 1972, he wore a bulletproof vest for one one day, but uh, that many years ago, they were so bulky and so on, he didn't feel comfortable with it, so uh, he gave it back. But he knew. He certainly knew. He also uh, often spoke behind a uh, bulletproof uh, podium, right? He did. Uh, but when he moved from behind it, it was, uh, you know, he was certainly vulnerable. And, the, and he loved to shake hands. My father was truly alive when he was campaigning. He, he served well and enjoyed serving and did a lot of good things for our state, I believe, uh, as, as the record shows. But he loved the campaigning. I, I've often thought as other candidates became weary and tired, he gained energy. He just loved it. And uh, I've never seen another one like him. You're pretty critical of President Nixon in your book. Uh, you note that there were people around him who would do anything to see him get reelected, and, and we, we've learned that, of course. But then in the next breath, you wonder who may have financed Arthur Bremer's, he's a would-be assassin, who financed Arthur Bremer's lavish lifestyle and his travels around the country. Do you think Nixon's people had a connection with Bremer? I think my father believed that. and Now, he accepted all the... The investigations the FBI did and uh, and the Secret Service did in terms of Bremer and the fact that their conclusion was he acted alone. But there's too much evidence, it seems to me, of some assistance because he was an un- unemployed busboy. But he traveled around the country and stayed in the Waldorf Astoria several times, flew first class, went to Canada, he bought cars, he went to massage parlors. Bought everything with cash. Uh, I know my father believed that s- there were some people around Nixon, not Nixon himself, but some people who were so desperate to have Nixon reelected they would do anything. And uh, But you know that the important thing in terms of that is my father forgave Arthur Bremer because he was a devoted Christian and he was at peace with that, but he always believed there was more to it than just Bremer acting alone. You mentioned earlier with your father winning all those primaries. And even when he wasn't winning the primaries, he was coming close. Yes. You thought that he had a shot at becoming the nominee? I really did, and I think he did too. Uh, had he gone to Miami and not been injured, and that he would have, I believe he could have been. A race against Nixon would have been tough because they were drawing from a lot of the same pool of voters. I mean, I mean that's what startled Nixon after 68, why he developed the Southern strategy. But certainly he would have, had he not defeated Nixon, he would have come much closer than George McGovern did. And McGovern used to call my dad every, virtually every day after he got the nomination, just almost begging him to endorse him. And my dad would tell him, because they were close personal friends, but he would say, I can't. I, it goes against everything I fought for and I actually bled for, George. He said, I think so much of you and your family, but philosophically, I can't accept this platform. And uh, so that was 1972. When your father died, um, there were many veterans of the Civil Rights Movement who said they had forgiven him for past sins. Yes. Do you think he came to terms with people he may have hurt in his past? Uh, I think there's no question about it. And he uh, reached out in every way you could and worked to make amends. And I like to think his journey is one we all took. And he, uh, as I mentioned earlier, went to Dr. King's church and told the congregation he'd been wrong and asked for their forgiveness. Uh, and I think to have won in 1982, Ken, the way he did with this 85, 90 percent of the black vote, they understood that the, he'd done many good things for our state, many populist initiatives that helped them as much as more or more than anyone. And uh, they knew he was sincere and uh, it really did uh, mean a lot to him, and his, especially in his later years. It is remarkable to think of, though, when he won his last term as governor in 1982, he couldn't have been elected without the black vote. Could not have been, would not have been. He won the runoff with it because two of the major political black groups, I think, endorsed his opponent. But so many of the blacks splintered off and voted for Governor Wallace because he appealed to them. And uh, 
and they again knew he was sincere, so he would not have won in ninety in eighty two without the black vote. No, you were the son of two governors. Uh, not many people in history could ever say that. What's one memory that stands out for you? It's uh, it was an interesting life. Uh, I must say, I think for me, one of the the highlights was watching my mother progress as a leader and as a uh, someone who captured the hearts of the people of our state in the way that. I don't think my father even had to watch her grow as a person and and become confident and uh, advocate initiatives to help the mental health and other things that, that people governors had never done before. It was wonderful for me to watch her grow as a person and as a leader. George Wallace Jr. is the former state treasurer of Alabama. His father was a four-term governor who ran for president four times. Forty-three years ago this week, on May 15, 1972, George Wallace was shot multiple times in an assassination attempt in Maryland as he was campaigning for president. It left him paralyzed for the rest of his life. George, I really appreciate you being on the program and sharing your memories. Well, Ken, thank you so much. I've enjoyed this, and uh, I uh, hope people will consider the book. I believe they find, will find the book an introspective, insightful, and very revealing chronicle of my father's life and our family's life. Well, the book is called Governor George Wallace... The Man You Never Knew, and you can get it on uh, your website, George Wallace Jr., that's J-R, georgewallacejr.com. George, again, I really appreciate this. Thank you, Ken, so much. You're